Um, you know, just a, a couple of years ago, um, I mean, first of all, let me, let me start by uh, thanking uh, Jeff for putting up uh, and setting up Satellite 2019 and the SGX team uh, led by Hashmita for this great event. Um, it, it definitely is getting better year, year by year. And uh, just a couple of years ago, I was sitting in the audience looking at people speaking and just thinking to myself, will I ever have that chance? Will I, will I ever grow into that privilege? And um, I'm grateful that I am here today. So thanks again to the SGX team for giving me this opportunity. And uh, what I would like to share with you a little bit today is my experience and the breadth of my experience, which has kind of expanded across what a lot of people call old school space and new school space. Or to be a little bit more specific, I myself am in the satellite subsegment of the space industry. So hence the title Space 1.0 versus Space 2.0. And I'm not a big fan of, of that when people say versus 2.0, because it's, it, that's not the case. Um, the case is that these two could work together and do work together. And the purpose of my talk today is to uh, bring you closer to an understanding of the, of the extent and the breadth of the space industry, the satellite industry, in all its generations and how it works together. Because hopefully, if you see a little bit of that through the talk today, uh, you will be able to better analyze the market, understand the scope of the market better, and who knows, maybe it will help you with your competitive analysis um, of, of your business dynamics, or it will help you with a career choice. Whatever comes out of it, I'm grateful that, that you're, you're giving me a chance here. So, you know, I, I contemplated a lot and I thought I would uh, put up a, um, a picture here of uh, the Night King versus Jon Snow talking about wars, but I'm, and I, I, there are no spoiler alerts for Game of Thrones up here, so uh, I'll, I'll leave that. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, so uh, a lot of people talk about new space versus old space and how new space is here to kill the incumbents of old space. And, and again, I don't really see that happening. I think that they're gonna work very, very nicely together. And yes, there are some differences and I mean, here's, a, here's an example we're looking at. On your left, or to the left, you see a picture of a very typical high throughput satellite, like the ones that are Intelsat, SES, or many great satellite operators are famous for, and many great manufacturers produce. And then to the right of it, you see that little box and you see that human being just to give you some sort of reference. And that little box is an example of a micro satellite that also does data networks and telecommunications. So it serves the same purpose. So yes, there are differences. Look at this. To the left again, you got this gigantic spacecraft with people in, in I, I don't know what you call these suits, the hazmat suits or whatever, and, and they're working on it in, in some highly specialized rooms. And to the right of it, you have a satellite that can be held in the palm of a human being. Now, while there are some differences, they're also very complementary because, again, they serve the same purpose or purposes that are adjacent to one another. And actually, when you do realize that, when you have those adjacent markets and you bring them closer together, you create even bigger synergies and you have a bigger value proposition. So why am I talking to you about this or what qualifies me to talk to you about it? I don't know if I'm qualified, but I'll, I'll just share with you how my career has developed. So I'm, I'm what people would like to call a, a millennial or Generation Y, and I hardly, I don't know, qualify for that because I'm uh, 36 years old turning 37 and uh, when I when I look around me uh, the millennial generation the oldest millennial that I know is John Conifer <laughs> and still he thinks of me as his grandpa when we talk at the office I go like oh John can you help me with Google drives can you help me write up a Google Doc I have no idea how to do that right so he calls me grandpa but then again on the on the other side of the fence um, in, in companies that are uh, more established or a little older in terms of age, um, the youngest older person was at least a decade older than me. And so there was always this disconnect and I was always kind of the guy in the middle who was never ever, um, you know, 
it just never belonged anywhere. And that's why I actually grow a beard, just to be taken more seriously by, by some of the chief officers of the satellite industry. So yeah, there was, there was a gap, but it, it actually, if anything, it, it helped me a lot in my career because what it led to is that I had to learn way much more than I was comfortable with to be able to communicate with these people. So very quick, very quick resume uh, fly through. Um, I was born in Kuwait City, and I grew up between Kuwait and, and Folkestone, a, a small fisher's town in the south of England. I, have, I still, till today, at the age of 36, have no idea why my parents went there. But anyways, I grew up between those two cities, and um, I, I, I love the 80s. I'm a child of the 80s, and the 80s gave me a nice childhood, a lot of beautiful beaches in the south of England, as well as in Kuwait. And I grew up bilingual, speaking English and Arabic. And then the war broke out, and we're originally Iraqi. I'm, I'm Iraqi. So I had to go back to Iraq, had to go back to Baghdad, and what I learned there was there's war, but there's a lot of kindness too, and you hold on to that very firmly, and that's where I started going to school, or having real school relationships. And then it got really bad in Iraq, so we had to leave. My parents had to leave. So we, we fled to Amman, Jordan, and out of there we were looking for ways to just have, have a, the closest possible to a, an okay life. So after finding some international smugglers, I was actually smuggled all the way to Thailand. Maybe some people are getting uncomfortable at this point. I promise you I'm not an illegal citizen or anything. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I went to Thailand. I, after, out of that, I went to Malaysia. And then in Malaysia, you know, I was just, I, was like, I had no idea what was going on. And then, um, and, and then I, you know, my parents found a way and then we made it all the way to Germany. And what I learned through that process is that you know, life is funny, it works out. And another thing that I learned in this process is there's Winnie the Pooh, and I started loving that cartoon and started following it wherever I go, honestly. Um, so after that, um, I, we moved to Munich, and I, I kind of grew up in Munich. My adolescence was there, I went to school there, and I, I learned German. I got my bachelor's and my master's in engineering, and it was my first exposure to the space and satellite industry through some courses over there got to know Europe, and I fell in love with the internet. Very first exposure to the internet. After that, I decided to go to, on an exchange program. I had been too long in one place, so I decided to go on an exchange program uh, back to Malaysia that never left my mind when I was in it, albeit under very hard circumstances. So I went to Cyber Jaya, which is the Silicon Valley of, um, of Malaysia, and it was a lot of fun. I didn't do anything engineering related. All I did was a couple of acting courses in an engineering school, managed to act in a movie that went national, and got on the debate team and participated in the All Asian Championships, and I flew to Korea out of the pocket of my host university. So that was just a whole lot of fun. <laughs> but the things had to get, had to get real uh, again. And, and it, not that it wasn't. Um, and then I was very lucky. I was, it, it, you know, the economy wasn't doing well. It was in the, in the midst of the financial crisis. I was throwing out applications left and right. And all of a sudden, I get a scholarship to do my MBA. And business had been something on my mind, wanting to combine business with technology. So I got, an, uh, I got this great opportunity to do my MBA in France. I moved to France. I learned French. Um, I worked in the energy sector, and it was kind of my, my first stepping stone in, into a career. And then, out of, out of that MBA program, I got recruited by my first satellite company and my first real employer, SES, moved to Luxembourg, where I kind of specialized in, in video broadcasting, and that was Space 1.0, um, or a company which is a good sample of Space 1.0. With SES, I moved to Washington, D.C., fell in love with Washington, D.C. 10 years ago, roughly. And I learned Spanish in Washington, D.C. because they put me uh, here on a project to manage a video the rollout of a video network in Mexico. Very interesting. I loved it, and I started learning more and more about uh, sales and account management and still Space 1.0. Then, given SES's investment in O3B, I moved to The Hague. And that was, um, again, another, another hop, but it was very interesting because O3B was the first, um, the first company or the first thing to be talked about which was not more of the same in the satellite industry after a, a long time of monotony. And it was a startup, it was very innovative, and I would want to call it Space 1.5. I didn't learn any Dutch over there. I hated the rain, so I decided to come back to Washington, D.C. In D.C., 
I, I, I continued doing uh, commercial and business related work. So I started working on product development after I had done business development and uh, corporate finance in The Hague. And then I, I wanted to break into some managerial positions and I noticed that if I had acquired or if I was able to say I have some analytical skills or consulting skills, it would, me, it would get me closer to that. So that's what happened. I, I left for some consulting gigs and I worked on two big projects for some Leo operators that, are, are, that have a big name and a great reputation today. And kind of moving to Leo from Mio, I got into space 1.75, I'd like to call it. And then that did give me a managerial position with Intelsat in fleet development, which is basically what you do where you combine the technical and commercial worlds to qualify product into the market. After that, a year ago, moved to San Francisco with Astronis, where I head business development. And all that is, I, I'd like to, like to think I, I, I'm in a privileged position. And all that was thanks to many of these companies, the Space 1.0 companies that gave me that chance. And Astronis is, is a quintessential San Francisco space startup uh, that is very different than, than 1.0, but works well with it. So what mattered? What, what did I learn out of all of this? orthogonal skills, like in my case, engineering versus business development or just business administration, mattered a lot and were important. Cultural skills, uh, the privilege that I had learning all these languages helped me a lot in terms of communicating with people and convincing them of skills. Soft skills, extremely valuable, more valuable than any of the degrees I acquired at school. I cannot emphasize that enough. And it made me a fungible asset. Basically, I could work in engineering, I could work in business development, and I could work almost in any geography. And one thing that I notice is that keep your eyes on a goal because in consistency, there's reward. And I, I didn't come up with that. My, my best friend today, he has become the, the, the mayor of Kabul in Afghanistan, since Afghanistan was mentioned in the talk, and he always said that to me. So I, I thank him for that. Um, so yeah, I mean, after having gone through all of this, what are some of the main things I've noticed and what is something that I want to relate to you about Space 1.0 and then Space 2.0? Again, Space 1.0, very big hardware oriented products and really the success of Space 1.0 was out of a dire need for telecommunications via satellite. The main verticals or markets for Space 1.0 were broadcast, video broadcasting and telecommunications, mainly led and funded by private equity. And in terms of reliability, 100%. You cannot go wrong with the reliability of Space 1.0. You can't wear uh, anything less than a suit without a tie on casual Fridays. And they use Microsoft Office. <laughs> Space 2.0 is not about the product. It's about a service and a value chain. So the beauty of it is it's a service that some space companies in space 2.0 don't even talk about themselves as a satellite company. They call themselves a service or a data company that relies on a black box, which is a satellite. So they add a lot of value. As you see here, they sell some images. They provide internet and connectivity, which has become a, a term, a uh, very popular term. And they're mainly funded by venture capital as opposed to private equity. And while, while their, their quality is great, but they do put more emphasis on sustainability of services and business models over reliability um, as with uh, Space 1.0. If I walked like this into Astronis, they would kick me out. They wouldn't even recognize me. So <laughs> this, is, this is good. And, and they use Google Drive, which again, <laughs> I'm still bad at. So what I wanna say is that these two spaces actually love one another and they work very well. And we have a lot of examples. SES acquired O3B, and it's one of the most important business lines for it today. Intelsat is a huge investor in OneWeb. Um, Arabsat, just, which is also a typical Space 1.0 company, they also launched on SpaceX. And the reason why these work together so well is because the old companies, if I may call them old, they are very interested in innovation, but sometimes the structure does not allow it, and the young companies in Space 2.0 are a breath of fresh air. Um, the young companies are interested in gaining customers, which the Space 1.0 companies have. So that's a huge privilege for them. And again, when you think about it, you're talking about a total addressable market of close to $130 billion. I mean, it is way much more than enough for all these companies to live together and coexist. You ask me where the future is going? 
These companies are going to continue working together and they're going to leapfrog to space 4.0, which will be characterized by three things that still haven't been taken into account. They're going to cloudify the infrastructure. They're going to apply artificial intelligence. And they're going to go further and further with nanotechnologies. And what that means, the entire space industry, or maybe satellite industry, I should say, is going to become exponentially bigger, but much more seamless and a little bit more invisible because, again, the emphasis is going to be on the end-to-end -end value chain. And so the, the last thing I want to I wanna leave you with, whether it's for your analysis of competitors or for your career choices, is have an open mind to both. They're both great and they teach you so much. And just diversify your skills and in consistency there's reward. And sorry I took too much of your time. Thank you.